Now I'd like to welcome Alicia. Hello, family. My name's Alicia. Hi, Alicia. Nice to meet you. It is such an honor to be here, and I, uh, I can't believe it's already here. It's already happening, and as you can tell, <laughs> a little excited. Um, I want to thank uh, Thor and, and everyone on the committee who was involved in putting this together, and um, my, my travel buddy artist who has taken me in and shown me your incredibly beautiful country. I was telling her that um, had I got stuck in a hotel room or something like that, I would have not had the experience of Iceland. And I think I need to get a t-shirt that says, I survived Iceland. <laughs> because <laughs> cause we did Fast and Furious, but we saw it all, or at least a lot of it. And um, she did a great job. Um, but thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, it's funny how God works, because I've, I've had the opportunity to speak in a, a, a couple of other countries, and um, my father lives in China. And he was in town visiting, and, and he asked if I, what speaking engagements I had coming up, and, and he said if, asked if I was going out of the country. And I said, no, it doesn't look like I'm going to this year. And it was uh, two days later, I had the message from Thor asking about this, and I called my dad I'm going. So um, it's amazing. And when I think about my life in the past and who I used to be and the shell of a woman that I was, um, to think about how my life has changed and that I'm now traveling around the country to carry a message of, of God's hope through the 12 steps um, of Al-Anon and, and other fellowships, it just blows me away. It's almost the, how did I get here kind of deal, you know? And um, just blessed to be a part of this. Um, first time I told my Alan on story, I was or I was preparing for it and thinking about it, and and I was like, okay, I've I've married an alcoholic. Well, I've married two alcoholics. Well, my mother's an alcoholic. Well, my uncle's an alcoholic, and it just hit me that <laughs> I thought it was just my current husband that was causing the problem, <laughs> but no, the problem goes way back to childhood, you know, for my family. And I'm from a, a town in in Texas, and. This lady and I were laughing that as soon as you hear Texas, you think everyone wears cowboy hats and, and rides horses everywhere and ropes things to get them, and that's not the case. But I thought that was funny when we were talking about it. Uh, okay. Um, but I'm from Texas, and I, I come from a fairly normally or a normal dysfunctional home, whatever you want to call it. Um, my memories of childhood are are very slim. I don't don't have a lot of them. But what I do know is that we were we were extremely religious. Um, I went to private school for ten years, raised in a Christian home. My father was a pastor at all the different churches that we went to. He's the worship leader, which is the the musician, the song player, and so the the rules in our household and and the God of our household, which is very strict and very confining, and and you must act this way or else and um, behind closed doors, our family was, was crazy, but every Sunday morning, we'd put on the Sunday morning face and get dressed up and praise the Lord, you know, <laughs> and, and smile and you'd be nice and you, and yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And then you'd get back in the car and get home and the insanity would begin again. And, and this was with no alcohol in the home at this time. This was just dysfunction. And. I can recognize now that I started to learn from a very early age how to act like everything's okay and how to begin this denial of my life is normal, you know, and, and just kind of this everything's great here. And I, I carried that throughout my whole life. I am a, an incredible actress who knows how to play the part, to say the right things, to make you believe that I'm okay. And I learned it from childhood. Um, at about 14, uh, my dad had an affair with the pastor's wife. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So things took a little turn. And um, my parents got divorced. We got kicked out of the church we were going to. Got kicked out of the school I was going to. My dad went on his um, little Christian path and kind of left us behind. And my mother began drinking at that time. And she had drank and, and done other outside issues during... Um, during hippie, hippie times, but I'd never seen her drunk in my life. And so as my dad left, the drinking for her had picked back up. And um, I also qualified for some other 12-step programs, and I, it's hard to tell my story without adding some of my own stuff in there. Um, 
But I began, my mother began, began to be my, my party buddy. You know, the, the mother-daughter relationship took a big turn, and I became the mother, and she became the daughter. And I had to take care of her. And um, she was the cool mom because, you know, my friends and I are starting to do teenage party stuff at the time. And she was the mom who you could party with, you know. And, uh, and so for a while it was fun. It was like, wow, look what a cool mom I've got. But as the disease of alcoholism progressed in her, it stopped being fun. It wasn't fun any longer. And we had hardwood floors at home, which... <laughs> It's not a big deal around here. They're everywhere. But we had them in our, and in our hallway, and you could hear her footsteps. And I remember as a little girl trying to go to bed and just praying that Mom would just go to sleep, and I would hear the coming down the hall, and it was just, no, no, no. I mean, we would get in trouble for, for not brushing our teeth long enough and for, did you dental floss? And she'd be screaming drunk, and it was like, Mom. And I used to hide dental floss under my bed just so I could show it to her as soon as she walked in. I'm, I'm just scared today to dental floss my teeth. God. Um, but it was, it was just things that it just started to go, to go south very quickly. And, um, you know, by 17 years old, I'm in my own journey of, of alcoholism. And, and I had a, a car accident that I, I hit a telephone pole going about 45 miles an hour. And I was in a blackout myself from drinking and almost died. Spent three months in the hospital learning to walk again and all kinds of things. And um, what I'm told happened that night is that I came, my friends brought me home and my mother was there and she was drunk. And apparently she and I got in a fight and I left and hit the pole not even half a mile down the road. And so my mother carried extreme amounts of guilt for that night. Because uh, only she really knows what happened. I don't. And uh, I began to find out how this victim role works at an early age. I clicked into it that if I would say certain things to make people feel sorry for me, I would get something. And it was like, hmm, you know? <laughs> so I began to become a master at this victim role, you know? My first sponsor used to say my V is flashing because I would be blaming something on someone at victim, 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 <laughs> because I'm, I'm good at it. And at, and at 17, I began to use this car accident as my victim trump card, as I like to call it. It was just when I'm about to not get my way, it was like, boom, boom. Well, what about my wreck? Oh. <laughs> you know? And I learned this stance very early on. And, and, and again, I'm so selfish and self-centered that I don't even think about the fact that my mother carries guilt of the coulda, woulda, shouldas. You know, if she could have only stopped me, if she would have done something different. She carried so much guilt, but I'm too selfish to care. I just know that when I play the victim, I get my way. And um, so that began to add more fuel to our relationship. And, you know, I go off to college at 18, and um, my younger brother and sister are still living there with her. And they're about, they're 11 and eight and 11 years younger than me. And so I at least was a teenager when I got to deal with my mother's alcoholism. They were children. And they got the brunt of this. And the most damage was done to them. And, um, you know, at one point my, my senior year, I had to run away from the house because one of her rages that she went into, and I went to go live with my sister, my older sister. And now I'm the older sister, and my younger sister's calling me, crying, I've got to get out of here, she's crazy, and she would come to stay with me. And so I'm, I'm watching just the pattern repeated, and I'm seeing the effects of alcoholism on my younger brother and sister. Uh, my brother, the way he handled it, his coping mechanism was um, anger and religion. He would hide behind religion and act like he was great and everything was fine. He followed my dad's path and would smile like everything's wonderful, but inside was this explosive little boy that was so angry, and you could just see it when you looked in his eyes. My little sister, she turned out to be, um, I was the caretaker for a while, and then she took, she took my spot and ran with it. She, to this day, um, she's 21, she's 22 now, she to this day is mom's biggest protector. And anything that goes wrong, she'll stand up for mom and cover up for mom and have some story or excuse. And, and yet she doesn't see that anything's wrong with her either. And um, so we've all, all five of us, there were five brothers and sisters, we've all were, had different stages of her alcoholism. But I was able to get out of the home, so I didn't have to live it anymore. Well, I go to college and um, I did Again, I've got my own disease going on, and so 
college wasn't really important anymore, and so I drop out of college, and I meet my first (laughs) ex-husband. I've decided to quit getting married because I have to label my ex-husbands. But uh, my first ex-husband, he had just gotten out of prison, uh, five years straight, alcohol and drug charges. (laughs) Um, Thank you. Oh, just wait. (laughs) I knew he abused women because his, I had been raised around him. His sister had been my best friend growing up, and so he was the hoodlum of the neighborhood, always in trouble. So he abused women. Um, he didn't take care of the two children he already had. He had no job, no car, no money, and he was all mine. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I absolutely believe that some of you women would have fought me for him. (laughs) No, he's too sick for you. I want him, you know. I mean, I don't don't know. I am a loser magnet, man. I just give me the sickest one in the room in every area, and I'm going to attract him. And, um, And that's what I did. And the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about made some decisions based on self that placed me in a position to be hurt. And that's exactly what I did in this relationship. Um, I made some decisions based on self. Let's see. I don't like to be alone, so here we go. Here's someone to latch on to. Here's a hostage I can take. <laughs> um, I was going to change him. Mm-hmm. And my, my Wayward Souls program, praise the Lord, was going to turn him around, and his family would see what an incredible woman I was. Um, I, um, again, at the time, I'm, I'm doing my own disease, and he's in, involved in that lifestyle, and so I like that, and the, the excitement that comes with it, you know, his bad boy, all this, uh, all his prison tattoos. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so I hook up with this man, and um, that began a, a six-month spread of, of probably the darkest time in my life, and um, this is where I really began to become a shell, I began to lose everything that I stood for. I began to lose my voice. I began to lose any self-esteem I had left, which wasn't much. Um, The abuse started with him at six months, and I stayed for six years. He almost killed me three times. Um, There were scenes where I'm at the bottom of the stairs of our townhome with my bags packed, and my nose is bleeding, and I'm bruised, and he's not anywhere around. I could have left, but I can't walk out the door. It was like, the, I could, so many people have heard that part of my story and go, why? And it's like, I, I don't know the answer. I just know that I couldn't. And that would happen a lot. And um, my, my changing him plan did not work. <laughs> but at one point, he got put back in prison. And um, I decided that if I married him while he was in prison, that would keep him sober. You know, I thought if I became Mrs. Satan. <laughs> um, if, <clears throat> if I became her, then everything would change. The abuse would stop. He would stop using so much. I mean, this is what I needed to do. And so when he was in jail waiting to be transferred to prison, I posed it, or as a missionary intern, I lied, and, and got up to the third floor of this jail that he was in, and we had a quick little 60-second ceremony. He was in a lovely orange suit. <laughs> <laughs> It was very romantic. We didn't have flowers and candles like this, but it was a quick little ceremony, and I am now Mrs. Satan. And I really was under the delusion that our lives were about to change. This was it. This was it. I mean, how could it go wrong? <laughs> well, when I left jail, <laughs> that sounds bad. When I left, left the church, <laughs> and they were throwing rice. I'm just kidding. They didn't do that. But as I left... I go to my mom's house, and here I've got my marriage certificate in my hand. I mean, I am just beaming. Look at what I've done. So proud of myself (laughs) in la-la land. And and I cannot figure out why, but my parents were not very proud of me. You know, they'd been raised around him also. His name is Kirsten. And they'd been raised around him also. I mean, he lived across the street. He terrorized our neighborhood. He was a peeping Tom in my window many times growing up as a child. They knew what he was like. And so when I showed him this certificate, they just shook their head. And I was in such self-delusion that I really didn't understand it. And I was crushed that they couldn't support me in my decision. Well, he spends a year and a half in, in, uh, in prison this time. And when he gets out... I have the, I, I'm ready for him. I'd gotten us a town home. I had it fully decorated. I, I mean, I had, I had stayed sober myself for that whole time he was in there. I'd stayed dry, rather. 
And um, I've got this wonderful life planned for him. Now I'm really fixing it. Okay, I've got this, I've got this. I'm the happy wife now. He's going to stay sober. <sighs> uh, within a month, we had a glass of champagne to celebrate that he was out of prison <laughs> for alcohol charges. And um, it seemed like a good idea to me. And, and that glass turned into bottles, and bottles turned into the insanity that, that we watch so much, you know. And um, my pretty picture, my happy family dream just <laughs> down the toilet. By the end of that stint with him, we had lost everything to the disease. Um, the couches were even gave, gave, excuse me, given away at the end to support the habit. Um, I'm, I'm probably 40 pounds underweight, sunken in eyes, hair falling out, bruises. I mean, I'm just dying. And I had a knife to my wrist, and I have a little scar to show for the night, um, because I was stuck. I could not leave. I would look at myself in the mirror and just go, what is wrong with you? Leave. And I couldn't go. And the lies I had told my family about you know, where this bruise came from or what was going on now or why we didn't have rent money and why. I mean, I was such a master game player that my, my relations with my family had been kind of severed because they were so tired of my lies, you know, because I would get caught in them and just be like, oh, well, I meant that we had And so I have no one. And I can't leave. Well, by the grace of God, I was able to leave one night and um, actually went myself to a treatment center to get help from my own problem. Um, but I get there to this treatment center, and I decide that I really don't have a problem with alcohol and drugs. It was just him. It was the man I was married to. So I decide while I'm in treatment that I'll find another hostage. <laughs> and and um, I did. I, I found a 19-year-old kid. <laughs> And I was like, love me, you know, and I'm <laughs> And here I am. I'm supposed to be at this treatment center for alcohol and drugs to try to get better myself. But, you know, Kirsten's been out of the picture for two days. And so, <laughs> what? Is that? <laughs> That's long, isn't it? I know. It was tough. It was tough going that long. Um, but he was only gone, you know, two days out of my life. And, and, and I... Um, I don't do well if I don't have someone to work on. You know, I've got, someone needs me out there, and I must find who it is. And so uh, I took this kid hostage and um, spent my whole 30 days in treatment wondering where he was, where he was going, what's going on. I, um, I was the model patient there, even though I didn't have a problem. These people had problems. I was just there to get away from Satan. And uh, so I spent my whole 30 days doing that. Um, I took notes in the doctor's meeting. I was voted most likely to stay sober. I was secretary of the community. <laughs> I was great. And, and I get out of there, and I decide to move to this small town. Uh, it's called Kerrville, Texas. It's about 60 miles away from my hometown of San Antonio. And, and there's not a lot to do in this town. You, you only do two things here. You either retire or you recover. That's it. <laughs> that's it. There's nothing else to do. We have a Walmart, which I think y'all know what Walmart is. And that's, that's all. Hmm. And so I think that this is a great move, you know, because San Antonio and the men there, that is the problem. If, if I move with my hostage, oh, he moved to Kerrville too, by the way, <laughs> a little incentive. But I moved to Kerrville, uh, and I don't do anything for myself. I don't do any meetings. I don't, I don't do anything. I really don't have a problem. I just needed to get away from San Antonio. And um, my whole plan got really ruined because my hostage relapsed. Poor guy. His name was James. I need to give him a name. James relapsed. And so here I am again. Now I'm in a small town with nothing, no God, no program, no anything. And I'm just, I'm miserable. So what do I do when that happens? <laughs> I find another hostage. Um, my first husband went back to prison during this year, during this time. And um, we had lost everything, so there was not a lot to split in the divorce. So I just sent him papers, and he signed it, and I was free. Within a month, I meet my second ex-husband. Uh, he was living at the men's halfway house, which actually, <laughs> those were the only meetings I would go to because they were very spiritual. <laughs> and they had a lot of men. But... Uh, I was like a, a predator, you know, it's just hanging out at sober men's houses looking for dates. And um, anyway, so I meet my second ex-husband, and um, he was in relapse, and I was in relapse. He was an alcoholic, I was an alcoholic, so it was love. I mean, just like that, it was love again. And um, that began an insane six-month um, binge with this man, if you will, that... Um, 
that my own disease took me to, to new depths and new levels and new darkness. And little did I know that I had hooked up with, with the chronic relapser. I had no idea. I, he had been to, at that time, probably 20 treatment centers and um, knew the big book from the title page to the period on 164. He could quote it. He knew everything. Um, he had a child that he had no rights to because of his disease. I knew none of this. I just thought he was cute, <laughs> you know. So I had no idea what I was getting involved with here. And um, in January of 99, uh, I don't know what happened. I don't, I don't know what clicked. I don't know what was different. But um, I knew I needed to do something to get help for myself. And, and I walked into a 12-step fellowship, and, and by the grace of God, I've been sober ever since. And he walked in that meeting with me. And we both picked up desire chips. And this was it, my new happy family. We were going to go to couples conferences. We were going to sponsor couples. We were going to travel the world carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had another great plan, you know. <laughs> he didn't follow my plan. <laughs> um, I tend to write scripts that don't ever get published, you know. People don't do what I want them to do. And when I had about two months sober, he relapsed for the first time. And... Um, that began just an insane journey that, thank God, brought me to the rooms of Al-Anon. Um, you know, my first AA sponsor, when I had two months sober and he relapsed, she said, Alicia, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Let him go. You know, she knew his history, and she was like, you need to leave him alone. He needs to get better. You're going to get in the way. And I'm so delusional that I'm saying, no, 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 he needs me. You know, all these men obviously don't need me, but I think they do. He needs me. I, I'm going to help him. Huh. Um, if I leave, who's going to help? I mean, all the, the insanity began. And, and so basically she tells me to leave, and it's probably a good idea. And I say, no, I'm not going to. And um, made a lot, of, a lot of decisions based on self again. And... You know, when I had about a year sober, I had kicked him out and let him back and kicked him out, and that was just a year of being with him. Then at a, when I had a year, I find out that I'm pregnant. And he was in treatment at the time, and um, I was just terrified because all I've ever wanted to do was be a mother. That's all I've ever wanted. But this was not the picture. This was not how I wanted it to happen. Um, I was living in a garage apartment about the size of this podium. I mean, it was like this big. <laughs> Bathroom, living room, kitchen. It was teeny. Um, I had a job that didn't have any insurance benefits. The father's in treatment. And I was just, I remember just holding my stomach crying, going, no, God, no. Not like this. How am I going to take care of it? What's going to happen? And um, I remember God just kind of giving me a peace that, it, that, that we were going to be okay. Regardless of what would happen to Shane, I was going to be all right with his child. And um, he stayed sober through most of the pregnancy. And so um, my, my denial begins to kick in that this is it. We are done. You know, the insanity is over. The happy family is about to begin. And then shortly before I give birth, um, he's missing. And um, my ex-husband is the disappearing alcoholic addict. He, he doesn't ever do it at the house. He's just gone. You know, he's... One day, he, I'm going to get a loaf of bread, and three days later, <laughs> he still doesn't have bread. <laughs> and it's like, huh? Eh? One time, bless his heart, he left to go get bread and came back with some dead flowers. He was like, I went to get bread, and I bought you flowers, but then I smoked crack. <laughs> it's like he had great intentions. He wanted to be there for me as a husband. He wanted to be there as a father. But this disease... He had no power to do that. And um, so the birth of our child comes. Um, they had to induce labor, and, and it, it didn't work. And so he went home to go take a shower and ended up, it was time to give birth, and I'm calling him. We lived about 20 miles away from the hospital, and I'm calling him, and he's not answering. It's like, no, 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 not today. Not today. And I just keep calling. I'm like, okay, he's taking a shower. He's taking a shower. La, la, la. I mean, I know. I know why he's not there. But my family's all around. I must act tough. I must act like he's the good, loving father. I've got to put the front on. And so here I am on the, the table. About I had to get a C-section. They're about to take me into the operating room, and he shows up. And there was a huge weight lifted because now I can act like, see, I told you, everything's fine. But I could see in his eyes. Everything was not fine. He was loaded. 
you know, and, um, God, what a nightmare, you know, this is all, this is, this is not how it happens in the movies, <laughs> you know, the baby's supposed to come, everyone gets cigars, everything's great, and this was not how it happened, and, um, ended up having to get, he stayed at the hospital with us for two nights and then went home to go take another shower, <laughs> damn showers, <laughs> um, <laughs> And he never returned, and this time there was no finding him. And a friend had to come pick me up from the hospital and bring me home, and, and I get home, and, you know, again, in, in my la la, in my fairy tale land, you come home to a welcome baby home party, and everything's happy. Well, I walk in the door, and he's loaded on the couch, and I'm just shaking, just shaking. And I am so disconnected from God at this point because the effects of this disease have gotten me so blocked from God that I am just miserable. I am a miserable human being, and I can't even enjoy this experience of this, this gift God's given me because I'm so angry at him. You know, then the baby would cry, and I would, just, I would just lose it. And, you know, by this time, I've quit going to my own meetings that I need to go to. When I did go to meetings, I would talk about God and the power of God and how spiritual I was. <laughs> but then I would come home to him, and you all know the movie The Exorcist? Yeah. My head would spin and I would, yeah, you know, I hate you and look what you've done to us and la la la. And I was crazy. So here I am. I'm living a double life again. I'm acting as if I'm Miss AA, but inside I'm dying. And it's around his disease. It's not even my own disease. And I'm crazy. So the baby's here. The happy family's together. And I'm miserable. Um, I think it took a couple more months uh, of insanity for me to finally walk into the rooms of Al-Anon because Shane said to me one day, he said, Alicia, you're not happy if I'm drunk. You're not happy if I'm sober. And I just, excuse me, because <laughs> here I've got years of sobriety now and I am Miss Kerrville AA, like it's a big town, <laughs> but I am Miss Recovery. How dare you say that to me? But for the first time I heard the words and I couldn't deny it any longer. My insanity had nothing to do with him. It was all about me. And it was a hard chunk of truth to swallow because it was like the little lie I'd been living my whole life. I'd blamed Shane for everything that was wrong with me, from headaches to stubbed toes to anything. It was all his fault, you know? And I'm, again, I'm the queen victim. I used to love to tell stories about how he had relapsed and what he had done this time. Oh, you know, and poor Ethan, that's my son. And I would just vomit this stuff on people without them even asking. I would, it was miserable to be around me. And so for some reason, all of a sudden, the blinders came off. And the truth sunk in that this had nothing to do about him. It was all about me. And as I walked into the rooms of Al-Anon... Um, a lot of the ladies that were in this meeting, they also, they had husbands who were in AA, so um, we have open meetings in Texas, and so they would come to those. And so they knew about me, and they'd watched me with, with Shane for years. And so as I walk in, they just went, finally, <laughs> you know, what took you so long? And um, I remember sitting in that first meeting and listening to these women share because um, the Tuesday night meeting that we have is kind of a newcomer's meeting. And I, you know, I thought I'd been so crazy for so long. And to, to sit down in a room full of other crazy people, <laughs> it was just welcoming. I, I wasn't the only one, you know. I wasn't the only one who sat up night after night just staring out the window, wondering if his car would come home. I mean, guys, I would sit there and just do this. I'm sure some of you can relate. And uh, just thinking, if I, if, if, I, if I take my eyes off the thing, his car may not come, you know? I, I would sit there, you know, and, and the car would come. Oh, go, is it him? Is it him? Is it him? Not him. And uh, hours of my life wasted at windows. And I'm not even doing drugs anymore. It was not even that. It was <laughs> waiting for him. Telephone calls, the phone would ring, and if it wasn't him, I wouldn't answer. You know, the, the isolation, I'd lost the friends. Fear, driven woman, that's all I was. Knowing that I was about to get the call that he was dead, and I would just pace around the phone, just waiting to get it. I know he's dead, I know he's dead, I know he's dead. I had no life. And yet, I miss AA. <laughs> you know, insane. And... um the sad part is, is that my son began to get affected as a child because he would need my attention, you know? He would need mommy time. He's just a baby. 
and yet I, I've got the stroller or the swing next to the window so I can stare out the window. Or as he gets older and he's trying to talk to me, and I'm going, stop it, just, just stop. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm snapping at him because I'm waiting for this. And wanting the voices to stop in my head, but they wouldn't. Wanting the plan to stop. Wanting the what-ifs to stop. Because apparently I am a master at what we call catastrophizing. Does anybody know what that means? It's like you, you have a little story. Something starts a little story, and then you run it all the way out until, you know, you're dead and you're in heaven. And it, I mean, it's like, wait a minute, you know. I can't tell you how many times I've run in my head the story of Ethan graduating from college. And he's having to share from the podium how his mother raised him because his father died from an overdose. And it's like, dude, he's two. He's in daycare. It's like, but I can't shut it up. It just keeps going and going and going. And so when I walked into my first Al-Anon meeting and I heard a bunch of you weirdos telling the same stuff, I was like, thank God, I'm not alone. And after you shared with me how we were the same, you then shared with me the solution. And I just wept because one of the things, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it talks about finding contentment and happiness whether the alcoholic is sober or not. And that was the hook for me. That's what got me. That just gave me chills because I could understand being happy if he was sober. But you were saying even if he wasn't sober, I was still going to be okay. I couldn't understand how that would happen, but I wanted it. And so I kept coming back, and I kept coming back. And... um my sponsor, bless her heart, she would try to help me understand how to separate the disease from the person. <laughs> and she would say, Alicia, anything that's negative and shame, you just say that's the disease of alcoholism and you let it go. And anything positive, you say that is God and that is good. And I would go, <clears throat> lady, the disease just stole my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a little slow learner, but... Um, but I understood the concept of what she was trying to get me to see. And what began to happen was a miracle. I began to see my husband as a dying alcoholic, as opposed to seeing him as the man who had ruined my life. I could see him as a dying alcoholic, and I began to have this love for him that I had never had. Because it was eyes of compassion. I was seeing him as a sick person. I, I, I have the same disease, and yet I would yell things at him like, why are you doing this to us? Why don't you just stop? And then it was like, oh, God, you couldn't just stop. But I'm, such in, I'm in such delusion that I don't get it. It's like he should be able to stop for me because I'm special, but I couldn't stop for my family, you know? So once I started to have this shift of thinking around him, it was amazing what took place. And, and the promise came true that I was able to find peace and contentment, or how it, those good words it says, whether he was sober or not, because he didn't stay sober. He didn't. And um, I live in a small town, so there were towns full of opinions on what I should do. Alicia, if you would just leave him, he would get sober. Alicia, if y'all wouldn't have had a child, you know, you had a child, that's too much pressure on him, so he can't stay sober. Alicia, if you would just do this and do that. And it got to the point that I would just... I remember one time I sat in my closet so Ethan couldn't find me, and I was bawling because Shane had relapsed. And I wasn't crying because he'd relapsed. I was crying because everyone I knew was going to be giving me their opinions on what I should do. And I just I, I knew it because it's what they did. And they judged me. I would walk into my meetings of my friends, and they would just shake their head because they would. it was just, it killed me. But I knew that I was seeking God through these steps. I knew I was doing what I needed to do and that God was going to take care of me, and that these people weren't walking in my shoes. They were just giving me their opinions, you know? Of course, they have no children. They're not married. <laughs> they don't have a clue, but they know what's right, you know, which sounds like me. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, as Ethan got older, he started to get affected by this disease, and um, uh, he started to understand Daddy wasn't there. And um, I remember one time I watched him... Before I'd gotten into Al-Anon, he was about two, I think, and he's standing at a window, and he's saying, Daddy, where are you? You're hiding. I find you. And I just started weeping because he's watched me. That's why he's doing that. <laughs> and it was like, that's not right, you know? And so the amazing thing that Al-Anon gave me, and there's a lot, but one of the things it gave me as a gift was the capacity to be a mother, 
to be present, to be there, to be focused on him, to help him instead of being the way I was, to be peaceful and content and, and not fear-driven, and I could be there for my son, regardless if Shane was missing, regardless if I knew the mortgage was not going to get paid now because the checkbook was gone. I knew, but I could be there for Ethan, and I could focus, and that's God. That is not me. And about two years ago, I guess it's been about two and a half years, another relapse happened, and... and, and um, this one was no different than the others. It, it was a little bit different. The car was gone this time and some, some other, okay, it was different. There was, a, there was a lot wrong. And I, he had the keys and so I had to let, Ethan was about three, three and a half. I had to let Ethan crawl through a window to go unlock the door because we were stuck. A friend had to give us a ride home. I had just paid $700 worth of bills and he had taken the check and I'm just, uh, and I remember sitting down and I was talking to my sponsor on the phone and something just, a week before he had relapsed, and I was still in the deal, in sickness and in health. This is a disease, I, unconditional love, blah, blah, blah. And then a week later, a week later, this relapse happens, and all of a sudden it clicked. I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't know what, what shifted or, or what changed, but it was like, I'm done. I'm done. And... um I began to um, prepare to file for divorce, and, and it, was, it was a total God deal because I could see on paper that financially I can't make it on my own. To be a single mother with a mortgage and a car payment, I can't make it. But I heard God say once again, I told you, I've got you two. I've got you. And so with the help of Al-Anon and AA and, and the people I know in this fellowship, I stepped out in faith that regardless of what came up, I was going to be okay. And... Um, that divorce was one of the hardest things I had to do because I loved this idiot. <laughs> you know, I loved him, but it, I was done, you know. And um, after we divorced, he stayed sober for almost a year. And so I was sitting there going, they were right. <laughs> if I would have just left, you know, and then I felt guilty for not leaving sooner. Um, but... But he stayed sober for almost a year. And that year, he had an incredible time with Ethan. He was able to be a father. He was able to be present. He would show up and get him. He had him every other weekend. We had split visitation. I mean, it was, it was a great year. And then it ended. And um, this last year, I don't think he's been able to put more than two months together sober. Um, he's attempted suicide. He, um, he's dying. And... Uh, one weekend he was around Ethan. I wasn't aware of this. He was using while he was around Ethan. And um, the way I found out was um, when I was around on that Sunday morning after Ethan had been around him, he said, Mommy, Daddy was sick this weekend. And I said, what do you mean? And he said his tummy was really sick. He was in the bathroom the whole time. And I'm not stupid. You know, and my stomach just flipped. And I said, Ethan... Did you see Daddy being sick in the bathroom, or did he have the door closed? And my five-year-old little boy looks at me and starts crying and says, Mommy, I said he was sick. Why are you asking me that? And he starts crying and runs into his room. Five years old, and he's covering up for Daddy. Five years old, he knows in his gut something's not right, and he's already learning how to cover up. And I just, Shh, that's it. <laughs> you know? And... Again, the power of Al-Anon. I'm able to go in there and hold my son and say, Ethan, Daddy loves you so much. He's sick. He needs some help. Instead of going, your father's a piece of crap, and he's jerk, and he's never been around for us, and I hate him, which is what my mother did to me about my father, you know. I'm pat not passing that on. I want this child to know how much his daddy loves him and that if he could be there, he would be, because that's true. This is a disease. My ex-husband is not a bad person. He's a sick person who needs to get well, but he's going to need to get well on his own because we're getting out of the way. The big book says the alcoholic's like a tornado roaring through the lives of others, and I am tired of being in the tornado path. <laughs> you know, it's time to get some shelter. <laughs> um, so two weeks ago, Shane left for a year and a half whew, treatment center. I don't know if this is going to work. I don't, I don't know. It's a different deal. It's not 12-step. It's um, a Christian-based program where you're basically locked up for a year and a half. But he had to tell Ethan goodbye. 
That's why I was telling Thor in an email when we were corresponding. It was like, geez, God keeps giving me current freaking experience to talk about. I was like, just stop. I'm tired of being used. <laughs> just kidding. But um, trying to explain to a little five-year-old who's looking up in his daddy's eyes going, how did we say it? Daddy's sick in his brain. <laughs> and he needs help so he can make better choices, so he can be a good daddy. He loves you so much, he wants to go away to get better. And um, in his own five-year-old little way, I think he gets it, you know. But again, because of this program, because of my sponsor, because of women that I'm accountable to, I know that if I keep seeking God, God's going to keep showing up. I know that if I will keep stepping up and carrying this message and sponsoring women and doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I get taken care of. That is why the 12th step is so important. If I will go out and I will think about you and what's going on in you and your life, then you think about God and God takes care of me. I think about you, you think about God and God takes care of me. And it's an amazing deal. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting at home in my house that I bought two years ago with um, healthy sun in bed, food in the refrigerator, you know, car to drive, and, and yet I'm feeling sorry for myself, you know, and the phone will ring, and it will be one of my sponsees, and if I will think about her and what's going on with her, by the time I get off the phone, all of a sudden, my life's not that bad. I'm going to end with this. <laughs> First of all, real quick, there he is. <laughs> Um, he's the biggest gift of, of my sobriety, my, my adventure through Al-Anon. He's the biggest gift I've got. Um, I end with this. Okay. Um, a few years ago, I spoke at a women's conference. It was AA Al-Anon, and I shared my story on both sides. And um, my dad listened to the CD of this talk, and he, his ministry is music. And he said, Alicia, God wants you to write some songs about what you've been through in your life. I'll put them to music, and we'll get them recorded. I was like, sure. I sing in the shower. <laughs> I don't write, and I have no money. But <laughs> I got it, Dad. But I sat down one night and decided to try writing a poem because I don't know how to write music. And um, I wrote this poem called Scars. And um, for me, external scars from my car accident, other battle wounds from my own disease, but more importantly, the internal scars, the pains, the hurts, the shame, the guilt, the fear, all the things that we deal with in here. And in this poem, it says, I asked God why all these things took place, things that changed me forever and caused such disgrace. His answer came clear. The tears began to lift. My child, those scars are your greatest gift. With my power behind you, we will change lives together. Trust me, keep seeking, and I'll leave you never. And that goes right along with the family afterwards. What a, what a great chapter. And um, uh, page 124, it says, This painful past may be of infinite value to other families still struggling with their problem. We think each family which has been relieved owes something to those who have not. And when the occasion requires, each member of it should be only too willing to bring former mistakes, no matter how grievous, out of their hiding places. Showing others who suffer how we were given help is the very thing which makes life seem so worthwhile to us now. Cling to the thought that in God's hands, the dark past is the greatest possession you have, the key to life and happiness for others. With it, you can avert death and misery for them. And that is the, the paragraph of my life. All my mistakes in my own disease, my mistakes with Shane and my mother, and I mean, all of it is going to be used it's my greatest asset today. All the things I used to be such a victim around are now my biggest asset. And because of these gifts that I have in my life, I have the power to help change people's lives. And when I see the light come on in a sponsee's eyes, that she realizes that there's hope from this. There's freedom from this. I know I've done my job. And when I get to use all this crazy insanity and all this pain around Shane to help another wife give strength, whatever it might be, I know I'm using my greatest asset. And what y'all are doing here in Iceland is just about that. You're continuing to carry the message. You're continuing to stand as a strong force and, and, and fight for what this deal is about.
this is a family disease and there's freedom on both sides. Um, I'm really going to freak you out. I'm going to end with singing the chorus of this song. You thought I was kidding. (laughs) We started doing some work on it and and haven't ever gotten a chance to finish, but um, it's going to be done. But when I'm done singing, I'm finished, and I just, again, thank everyone for having me here. I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow. But, um, okay. I get very nervous every time I do. <laughs> so who now with God's power all the scars make sense? My spirit protected, I have found my defense. There is hope for you, cause there was hope for me and He'll walk you through it. Believe that you're set free from the battle deep inside. And it's more than you can bear. And you're crying out for comfort, finding nothing there. There is hope for you, cause there was hope for me. And he'll walk you through it. Believe, oh, 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 you can be free.